Hi FGC family and friends. Really good that you could join us today and welcome. What we hope will be the last lockdown Sunday and then we can start getting back to having normal services again. Uh, further information will be out about that in the coming week. So before we start today, I just want to read some uh, scriptures from Colossians 1 verse 15 onwards. The sun is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in all things he may have preeminence. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. So let's worship him now together.
sound of his voice And sees that I shaken and stood Can be calmed and broken for my regard And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And through it all, through it all it is well It is well
Good morning, everybody. As we come to prayer today, let us think of Psalm 95, verse 2. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. And there's a song that I love to sing. It's a very simple song and it says, Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. So let us pray today. Father, today we give thanks to you because tomorrow our lives in some ways will change. Our government are leading us through a time to come out of lockdown. And Father, we just pray that you will give each of us the wisdom to do this in the way you want us to. Let us listen to your voice, Lord. Let us be aware of anything we might do to just make things worse. And Father, we pray you would give us wisdom, your wisdom. And Father, as we think of this time of restrictions easing, I pray, Lord, for those who are still going through tough times, those who are sick, those who have come through sickness and are going through treatments. Lord, I pray for those who are separated from family because they live in other countries and they can't see them. Father, this still is a really tough time and I pray that you will help us all, each one, to support and love one another. And Father, as we, again, we come to this time, I pray for our government, I pray that they will have the wisdom from you to lead us safely through. Father, I want to thank you for each and every one of them. And I pray for our Christian MPs and all those, Father, who strive to do your will, which affects our lives. Lord, I pray for those who have been bereaved and ask that you would give them strength for each new day. At a difficult time, Lord, when they've not been able to celebrate in the way they want to the life of their loved one. Father, we just ask that you would give them a renewed strength in you and a heart which can sing to you. Lord Jesus, we just pray for those in, who are serving you in other countries to bring your word and your work to those who need you most. And Father, we pray that you would give them strength and wisdom and the finances to do all that they want to do for you. Oh Lord, we just now praise you that you have brought us to this time when our country can look forward. We just look back, Lord, and we just are amazed at the way you have been with us. And I just thank you, Lord, that you've been with me. That at times, Lord, when there's been nobody else to talk to because we were so restricted on what we could do. But, Lord, you are always there. You, We can always come to you, Father. And I just thank you. Help me always to be thankful, Lord. May we remember, Father, all that you did for us in sending Jesus. And I pray, Jesus, that you will be the light forward for us, that you will light our way. Lord, we just thank you with grateful hearts for all that you have done and pray that you will lead us through this week ahead, that you will give us the strength to do what you want us to do ears to listen and hearts that are open to your word. We just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Communion. Why do we do this every week? Well, because we're asked to. And also, God knows how easily we forget. 
we can easily get distracted, can't we, by other things during the busyness of the week, by our work, by trying to earn money to make ends meet, focusing on ourselves, on other things, uh, putting other things first instead of God in our lives. And we can forget what life is really about. That God has saved us and there is a purpose to life. Taking communion, I think, puts things back in perspective. Well, it does for me. That God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. and makes us realise also that because of this good news, we should make sure we tell others about it. Thinking we need to get the R number up to at least three as Christians, don't we? If we as Christians got the R number up to three and infected others with the love of God, just think what that would do in this country. So as we take communion and we remember what God has done for each of us, let's get things back in perspective and also think about how important it is to tell others about the good news of God and his love for them. Let's read some verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says this. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. goes on to say, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we've just remembered what you have done for us, that you sent your Son to save each one of us. Father, as we go into this new week, we pray that you will give us the enthusiasm to tell others the good news about you as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today we're studying Jeremiah 9. And Jeremiah was wholly committed to God, but he was persecuted by his own people because of the message that God asked him to give to them. It was quite a strong and tough message about judgment and the impending judgment that was coming by the hands of the Babylonians. But despite his persecution, he never lost compassion for his people. Jeremiah was nearly 20 years old when he began to prophesy, and he continued doing that for most of his adult life, some 40 years or more. Because his message held very little weight with the people, Jeremiah's prophecies reveal a substantial amount of emotional depth, often sorrow over the plight of God's people. In 40 years, we don't read of one person turning back to God. If we'd been out on the mission field for 40 years and hadn't seen one convert, maybe we'd be getting a call from head office questioning what we were doing and our methods and maybe even calling us back and replacing us with someone more effective. Or if we were involved in something at church and no one took any notice or we didn't get any results or praise from others, would we stick at it for 40 years or just simply give up? This isn't exactly a cheerful message. So it's very tempting just to 
uh, skip the doom and gloom in these these books and move on to something a little bit more palatable. But it, it's there in Scripture. It's fifty two chapters, and then it's followed by another five chapters in Lamentations. So that's ninety pages in my Bible. God sees this as important and is emphasising it. And so we should too. We should make it important to read these things, even though it's tough reading, and to try and be understanding and to be knowledgeable about it. Judgment was coming to the people of Judah. And you may ask how a loving God can allow judgment on his people. But God has laid down clearly what would happen if the people followed his covenant and how he would bless them. He also warned of the consequences of turning away from him and worshipping false gods and idols. In his love, God allowed them to go their own way, to do their own thing. He gave them over to their own desires rather than force them to worship him. For about 900 years, God waited patiently as the people of Judah turned their backs on him and the original covenant between God and the people of Israel in the Sinai Desert. We read about that in Exodus 24, 1 through to 18. But now judgment was coming. Such an extended period of time, 900 years, witnesses to God's great patience and mercy, allowing his people the opportunity to turn from their sinful ways, a lifestyle that began not long after they struck the original covenant with God. You read about it in Exodus 32. God had been patient and sent prophets to warn the people, but they had been ignored, and now it was Jeremiah's turn. Judah was a broken nation, and the people were broken as well. And we can see parallels with our modern society today and how broken it is, and how broken it has become. As we read this chapter, it's hard to know who is actually speaking in the first verses. Is it God's words and his sorrow being expressed? Or are we reading Jeremiah's words and his grief? The two seem to be intertwined. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Jeremiah is sometimes called a weeping prophet because of this verse. His love and concern for the people brought him to tears. Many tears, so many that he simply did not have enough. In verse 2 we read, Oh that I had in the desert a lodging place for travellers, that I might leave my people and go away from them. For they are all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. Do you have times where you just want to get away? Quick break in the caravan or motor home or off to your holiday home for the weekend just to get away from it all? When life gets tough or work too much and the pressures build, I'm sure you do, and Jeremiah was the same. His grief and concern for the people of Israel was a great suffering for him and caused him great pain. How do we feel about those around us who are broken, lost and consumed in their lifestyles, disregarding both the Lord's commandments and the increasing danger that will result from their disobedience? Does it bring us to tears, to our knees in prayer? Is it a heavy burden for us? Do you see the contrast between verses 1 and 2? Jeremiah is unable to express the extent of his grief. He feels he could weep forever, but then on the other hand, he knows that judgment is fitting and they deserve it. And as he turns to consider the sinful city in which he lives, Jerusalem, he wishes he could leave it and go to some quiet resting place in the country. Verse 3 says, And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not valiant for the truth on the earth, For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. Everyone take heed to his neighbour, and do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbour will walk with slanderers. Everyone will deceive his neighbour and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves to commit iniquity. Your dwelling place is in the midst of the deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, says the Lord. What a clear picture Jeremiah is giving us. Judah's society is characterised by lies and deceit. How they can use their lies as a weapon, forming a bow with their mouths and shooting out arrows of lies. And they proceed from evil to evil. And that explains why they can do this. Because they did not have a relationship with God. 
In verse 3 it says, They do not know me, says the Lord. We can say that they knew about God. They certainly did. And they went to their equivalent of a church. But they didn't really have a true relationship with God. Jeremiah's dark description of Judah can also describe our modern culture. We live in an age where the idea of absolute truth is commonly rejected. What is true is not valued. People make up their own truths to suit their own situations and and agendas. And what is true is not valued and when that is the case, societies crumble. You don't have to look far to see this happening. People have turned from God and made themselves a God they will worship and our society suffers as a consequence. Jeremiah foresees a desolation in Judah with its cities ruined, its pasture lands destroyed and its people either killed or taken captive to a foreign land. In verse 12 it says, Who is a wise man who may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken, that he may declare it? Why does the land perish and burn up like a wilderness, so that no one can pass through? And the answer is that people have turned away from God and have followed heathen gods. They've turned away from the law of God and followed their own stubborn hearts. Verse 13, And the Lord said, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but they have walked according to the dictates of their own hearts and after the bars which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says the Lord of the hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood, and will give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the Gentiles, whom neither they nor their fathers will have known, and I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. They have turned to other gods, worshipping Baal, one of the gods of the Babylonians. The Baals were were many different gods, and you could sum up their orientation as anything goes during their worship. Sexual promiscuity, licentiousness, and wine was consumed in great quantities in thanksgiving to Baal for the fertility of the vineyards. The wine also helped to induce an ecstatic frenzy, which was climaxed by self-laceration. Child sacrifice was the norm, it was a feature of their rights. And yet still people had to ask, why? Why was Judah facing judgment? They had followed their hearts. They had walked according to the dictates of their own hearts. They are only interested in themselves. Maybe the prophet Jeremiah could pathetically see towards uh, our society. It's the same message that we hear from society today over and over again. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Do whatever pleases you. That's how you will find true contentment, true purpose and happiness. Humans are worshipping creatures, I think. God made us that way, to worship him. So if we stop worshipping, then that instinct to worship will still crave something and look for something else. Look at celebrities, how they worship, football teams, pop bands, etc. They and much, much more have all become gods for our society. Verse 17. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Consider now, call for the wailing women to come. Send for the most skilful of them. Let them come quickly and wail over us until our eyes overflow with tears and water. Streams from our eyelids, the sound of wailing is heard from Zion. How ruined we are. How great is our shame. We must leave our land because our houses are in ruins. Now, you women, hear the word of the Lord. Open your ears to the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters how to wail. Teach one another a lament. Jeremiah knows what is coming, yet would be prevented if the people... Jeremiah knows what is coming, yet this could be prevented if the people truly repented and turned back to God. And these wailing women, this was a profession where it was passed down from woman to woman and the women were trained... Any trainees were called daughters, and they were trained and paid to perform the public ritual of funerals. They're probably the funeral directors and grief counsellors. And these women walked with the body, they wept and wailed with the family and sang and chanted hymns and psalms and laments composed for the occasion. And they allowed the people, the families, to grieve without embarrassment and, and to never be alone. But Jeremiah is saying, teach more and more people, bring more daughters on board, because there will not be enough people to wail and mourn over the desolation that was coming from Babylon. Verse 21. Death has climbed in through our windows and has entered our fortress and has removed the children from the streets and the young men from the public squares. Say, this is what the Lord declares. Dead bodies will lie like dung on the open field. 
like cut grain behind the reaper, with no one to gather them. This passage is getting more doomy and gloomy as it goes on. During the time of harvest, farmers would bring in the sheaves. One worker would cut the stalks and bundle them together, then place them on the ground once the pile was big enough. And then another worker would come along and gather them up, tie them together um, and gather them in. And the picture here is uh, of death, of people dying, but no one being there in so many bodies that no one be there to actually be able to gather them in. It's a, it's a horrible picture of the judgment that is coming. And yet the people couldn't see it and couldn't turn back from what they were involved in and didn't want to see it. And Jeremiah is telling the people of Judah what is coming if they don't repent. Yet they will not listen. Instead, they glory in things that don't last. This is what the Lord says in verse 23. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. They are boasting in their wisdom, which fades and goes out of date. And however much wisdom you think you have, there will always be someone with more than you. And they boast in their strength. And it doesn't matter how many times you go to the gym, age will eventually take your strength away. And there will always be someone who can bench press more than you can. And they boast in their riches. You might have a large bank bank balance and be comfortable and well off. But money can disappear. It can go overnight. You can't take it with you. We're saying here, don't waste your time boasting about things that will not last. The interesting thing here is it's not the boasting that is the problem. Rather, God says, if you boast, then boast about me. Boast about something that's worth boasting about. That you have the understanding to know him. That's what we should be boasting about, that he is the Lord who exercises kindness, justice and righteousness on earth and he delights in these things. And it's these things that can turn a broken nation into a wholesome nation, turning back to God, repenting and seeking to understand and know him in a real way. God sent his prophets to reach the people and tell them about the coming judgment. His desire was to have them turn back to him, but in his love for them he allowed them to follow their hearts rather than force them to worship him. If they had turned back to God, the judgment could have been averted. And in closing here, maybe this morning you were feeling broken, burdened by the world, lost in sin. My prayer for you would be to give it all to God, confess your sins and let God's love and salvation encompass you. Amen.
covers me with destiny It's making all things right The precious blood of Christ It's rewriting my history It covers me with destiny Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really good to have you with us. And for all those who have taken part today and helped us to get closer to the Lord through the service, we thank you to them. Really pray you have a good week as we try and get back to some sort of normality and that the Lord will bless you and keep you safe. Uh, just going to read a scripture as we go. Isaiah 49. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young people stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The Lord bless you. Bye for now.